What is up, everybody? Welcome to The Stack. I'm Alex. I'm Justin. What's up? I'm Pete. And on The Stack, we talk about a bunch of books, and then Justin gets very angry and leaves halfway through. Oh, I'm going to storm out. I'm going to be so (laughs) upset by these opinions. I'm walking out of here. I just don't know when, but it's probably going to be like 35 minutes in. Uh, (laughs) But my temper's going to be out of control. Yeah, no, Justin has somewhere else to be, but uh, we will get to that point and then continue on because we have lots of great comic books to talk about. Kicking it off with Miss Marvel, the new mutant number one from Marvel, written by Aman Vellani and Sabir Perzada, art by Carlos Gomez and Adam Gorhan. This is kicking off of the Fall of X event where Miss Marvel is now both an inhuman and a mutant. She died, she's back to life. We're following all of that continuity from TV's Miss Marvel herself, as well as one of the writers of the Miss Marvel show on Disney Plus. A lot of anticipation, a lot of hype on this. What'd you guys think about the issue? We got to toss it over to our Fall of X correspondent, Pete LePage, with his take on this one. Um, Pete, you've disliked every page of this event so far. What do you think about this one? Well, this is great because she's back. You know, it was dumb that they killed her off. Um, I really think they have some great covers. I I just think this was just so fun. Uh, Loved the uh, kind of emotional moment where her and Bruno are are eating and then she kind of breaks down everything and he's just overcome and and hugs her. It was just really sweet and such a nice moment and adorable. Uh, Art super type bananas. I mean, this is just such a great book to enjoy. So you like this? I I like Miss Marvel, yes, as a Ooh, character. That's making me so mad eventually in a little bit. I'm going to be so mad about the fact that he <laughs> liked it. Uh, because I also like this. I thought this was a really nice uh, reintroduction. And for first time, ostensibly first time comic book writers, I thought this is a really great step in. Like, you know, you never know when someone who is writing a book and co- stepping into the industry is going to come in and, and do it. And this was really great, really great understanding of the character, taking the themes and pushing them forward into this sort of complicated new paradigm of, of uh, her being part, a, part of the Inhuman world, part of the X-Men world, sort of introducing herself to the world as an X-Men through her clothing as she's going on in a fight and people trying to stop her. She has to tell Bruno how she, you know, confessed what's been happening with her. I just that a lot going on, but really well handled book and really nice art. I agree with that. This chewed off a lot in this first issue. We start off with this recurring nightmare that Miss Marvel is having where she's picturing all the different directions that she's being pulled into. Is she an Avenger? Is she a champion? Is she an Inhuman? Is she an X-Men member? What is she? What exactly is going on with her? Leading up to something that I think we're going to get a little bit more of. There seems to be like a Doctor Strange Silver Surfer who is in her dreams or something like that. So I think the implication here is these nightmares is something else going on. So that feels like enough to drive a book. But on top of that, she is in the middle of this fall of X event where Orcus has taken down the X-Men. They are also loved by the general public and they have taken over the Empire State University campus. She's going there for a summer program. So that's going on. That also feels like that's enough. But then also, she's supposed to be undercover for the X-Men, trying to find out what's going on with Orcus at that university. Of course, in classic Miss Marvel fashion, she kind of messes that up immediately. But we get, again, there's a lot of different plates that they have in the air in this book. And the entire time I was reading the book, I was like, Mm. Is it, wh- when is this going to come crashing down because there's too many things happening? And then it didn't. It, it, they really made the characters work. They really made the emotion work. I was very happy with this book. Cool. I thought Sometimes you were going to say you something more. Here, you're just setting up yeah. for a great, good, great meal. There you go. Exactly. That's that's all the great chefs like Raimi from Ratatouille do it. Let's move on to talk about another big issue this week. Mm-hmm. Night Terrors. It's the only chef I know. Night Terrors, Night's End, number one from DC Comics. It's not true. Written by Joshua Williamson. Art by Howard Porter. You're thinking of my cousin, Adina. Art, art no, by I'm Howard Porter. No, I'm thinking of Stray Bullets, our oh, chef. Oh, oh okay. You... Our... Yes. Okay. I guess no, I remember. I Alex guess I took that title away from him. <laughs> Stop that. I'm the CBC chef. Nope. 
Art by Howard Porter, Giuseppe Cabancoli, Trevor Hairside, and Stefano Nessi. This is bringing to an official end the two-month Night Terrors event as the entire DC Universe comes together to fight against insomnia. We get to see that battle. We get to see how it all turns out. And we also get to tee up for the next big event. We have talked about every single issue of Night Terrors over the past two months. So we are heavily invested in this, yeah. or at least heavily time invested in this. How do you think it panned out? How what did you think about this issue and how did you feel about the event as a whole, Pete? Well, yeah, I continue to love this event. I think it was just a, a, a lot of fun and uh, it was fun to see DC kind of lean into these like creepy kind of nightmare characters and had really a blast with a lot of fun covers and and kind of taking uh, characters we know and kind of playing with their fears and that kind of stuff. But uh, yeah, I really thought the Dead Man versus Insomnia in here was great. And I love the splash page of uh, Cliff yelling fucking hate magic it was just uh, a ton of fun uh of course you know then you got amanda Waller coming in there and fucking shit up so it's like god damn it uh but uh yeah uh blast uh, had a blast with it and i'm looking forward to what's coming next justin i agree a lot of great layouts in this issue i thought uh, there's a great uh, moment where uh, Dead Man has his face parted open in a cool way. Another great uh, single-page horror panel of Dead Man. I love the way that Wesley Dodd sort of just sits back down in his little grave <laughs> and goes to bed. Um, it's sort of sad. Uh, but the the reveal at the end, what did you guys think about this? This is, is a spoiler, but we get a character named Dr. Hate. The mm -hmm. Dr. Fate of Hate. I... Ooh. I know that was not meant to be hilarious. I thought it was kind of hilarious, but it's also very comic booky. We get a mystery silhouetted character, probably a hero, who is taking on the Nightmare Stone and the Helmet of Hate to become Dr. Hate, who is going to be the villain behind the Beast World storyline. Um, it's it's goofy, but it's comic book goofy. So yeah. my my like cool dude hat was like, Oh, this is dumb. But then when I thought about it for a second, I was like, nah, that's fine. It's cool. You can have Dr. Hate powering animals taking over the world. I'm okay with that. That's fun. It's very comic booky. Let's have a good time. And, and just so we're clear, because you wear a lot of hats, when you wear your cool do hat, uh, do you wear it to a skew, you know, like Justin does? Is that how we know it's? Yeah, there we go. What's there, up, okay. Teach? Yeah. yeah. I really like yeah, this event maybe. as well. I was very impressed by it. I think. You know, not everything crushed it across the board, but there was a better hit than loss ratio going on here. And I love these experiments. I love them doing like, we're going to do a crazy all in two month event. That's fun. More of that, please. Or at least once a year, please. And then we're good. Yeah, once go. a year, please. <laughs> yes. Once a year, sir. Black Hammer, the end, number one from Dark Horse Comics, written by Jeff Lemire, art by Malachi Ward. This is per the title, potentially bring the Black Hammer saga that Jeff Lemire has been writing for a couple of years here to a close. Yeah. So there's a lot going on here. This started as a relatively simple story of a bunch of superheroes who were living on a farm and lost their memory and we didn't know why. Now it is ending up in a crisis on Infinite Earth's style finale where the evil Black Hammer needs to come kill the one remaining Black Hammer who can stop him, who doesn't want anything to do with this, and she's on the farm. It's all coming down to this. This is some great superhero comics. Like, even if we've gotten so far from the premise, this is so good. We talk a lot about how we love Jeff Lemire stuff, but sometimes it's like, what's happening? What are you, what are you, you're yeah, taking the time spare. here. Yeah, it's a little spare. This is not that. This is packed. There's so much emotion. There's so much serial heroics. There's so many ideas. It's great. It's hard to write like a Justice League analog original story and have it be different or not like such a response to the initial premise that it is becomes a little bit of a cliche. And I feel like Black Hammer does that maybe the best. Like I love all these individual characters, especially Colonel Weird. So I'm excited that Colonel Weird is yeah. going to be extra weird in this, uh, this final <laughs> story. Um, so I, I've been really on board with this um, since we started reading it. Yeah, I'm having I continue to have a great time with this. This is a kind of a tripped out fun team book um, that's got a lot of moving pieces. We get some information here, but we're not we don't have not everything's tied up yet. But man, 
uh, just kind of uh, very excited to see what happens with this book. Jeff Lemire is doing such a great job with this book. It's really fun. It's not just kind of like a parody. It's deeper. There's a lot of levels to it. So I'm, I'm having, I continue to have a great time with this. Uh, the art's fantastic. And could I give one shout out to Inspector Insector, which is yes, maybe one of the best names for a character in a very long time. He's a giant bug detective. It's great. I would read an entire series just about him. Oh, I yeah. love the way I'm he hooked. smokes his cigarette in his mandibles. It like <laughs> sticks at the like way far away from his mouth. Ah, man, it's good stuff. I also like how he's like, hey, uh, before I go to bed, can I get some booze or something? Uh, you know, just been there relatable yeah. man marvel yeah, age <laughs> marvel age 1000 for marvel written by mark wade ryan stegman rainbow rowell dan slot armando ianucci steve oh. mcniven jason aaron j michael straczynski art by alessandro cappuccio ryan stegman marguerite savage michael and laura allred adam kubert steve mcnevin pepe laraz and Kari andrews this is i believe the third of these style anniversary issues that marvel has done paying tribute to their history the previous ones teased things that were coming forward this one as far as i can tell does not it's just a bunch of stories about marvel Gosh. history paying tribute to the characters from some all-star teams what you guys think about this anytime you see the words marvel age you know you're gonna get a, a robot human torch story to bang <laughs> off the first one I, I was like oh the old pinocchio talk is back and so i was like but overarching i thought this was a great sort of compendium just highlighting some of my faves i love the silver surfer story by um steve mcniven oh yeah that was really good so good with um silver surfer and mephisto having sort of a um like the last episode of lost almost you know Mm -hmm. like a conversation where they're basically playing chess on a beach which i think we all understand that reference and consider that a high form of entertainment uh, I also really liked the uh, the Jason Aaron story about the um, the woman yes. who hates superheroes was very cool. Great story, yeah. Just a lot of good stuff. Yeah, and, oh, and just, sorry, just, just, the, just this Cyclops Jean Grey story I thought was beautiful. Damn it! Done. I was really hoping you weren't going to do that. That was the I, Rainbow Rowell Marguerite Savage. That's an amazing team to put in a romance story. Come on! Yes. Uh, I just want to mention real quick the Jason Aaron story is a pretty clear riff on the boy who loves Spider Man and taking it and flipping mm-hmm. it and reversing it. So very impressive. Pete, what about you? What did you like? Yeah, overall great collection of stories, but just to highlight some favorites. Uh, the second one, the Spider-Man lizard story was mm-hmm. unbelievable. The art was super tight bananas. So much fun because also MJ was in there. So, yeah, keeping it real. Um, and then Daredevil with the hearing issue was a little weird. Silver Surfer was, was unbelievable. Art was going great. And then you had to bring up Mephisto into it. Uh, did but you yeah, see the... Mephisto say, like, hey, Silver Surfer, did you hear Mary Jane? It was in this book a couple of stories earlier. Yeah, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go it. back a couple of pages and steal her marriage again. But uh, yeah, the Jason Aaron story uh, was just so touching and and so nice and well done. Great. It kind of made the whole thing worth it. Can I call out the one that Pete? didn't work for me? Oh, wait, go ahead, Pete. Uh, and and as far as what you guys were gonna say about the Jean Grey Cyclops bullshit, art was phenomenal. Just really, any other characters to do a love story would have been better, but. What you a know, cold heart you their... have, Pete. That's a beautiful story. Just because it's a, a young Cyclops before he did the things that made you so mad at him. He's Still just a douchebag. Like, nobody, nobody douche writes. Shouldn't be happy. Nobody writes romance like Rainbow Rowell. She crushes it. Crushes it. The one that didn't work for me is the J. Michael Straczynski story. Was that the one yeah. that you were thinking? No, and, 100%. I mean, this is partially inspired by the fact that we had like Tom Scioli on the live show this week talking about I Am Stan, but the idea of doing this revisionist history story where Stan Lee, Jack Kirby, and Joe Simon, I believe, are all like kids just playing in the yard together, imagining worlds. I was like, no, they hated each other. They hated each other and ruined each other's lives. What are you doing here? Like, I, this was... I, I appreciated the sentiment, and I thought I think it was Kari Andrews art, of course, oh, yeah. gorgeous, oh, yeah. absolutely great on here. Um, 
but this to me was the same sort of sentiment as like Dr. Doom crying at the World Trade Center 9-11 thing. Wow. <laughs> where I was like, wow. well, that was also JMS. Dude, where I was like, on, bro. You got to pull it back sometimes, bro. Too just soon. Just like JMS. Just like, don't bring up 9-11, dude. Too soon. I don't know. This is uh, this is um, our 9-11, you know? Oh, my God. You're <laughs> 9-11. Uh, I wow. also All really I'm like... saying is Jack Kirby and Stan Lee's friendship can't melt steel beams. Wow. I love this conspiracy theory. You know, I was going to storm out, but I actually might stick around now. This guy's got some strong opinions. <laughs> uh, the dance lot X-Men uh, and Spider-Man and Hulk one was also good. Yeah, this is a great collection. I was really impressed yeah. by it. I mean, clearly it's Tom Brevoort doing the editing, and he put together some all-star teams. So if you're looking some, for some good Marvel stories, this is one to check out. Let's move on to talk about Action Comics Presents Doomsday Special, number one from DC Comics, written by Dan Waters, art by Eddie Barrows and Eber Ferreira and Max Rayner. This book... I know this was teased a while ago. This came out of nowhere for me in terms of being advertised in books last week. And I was like, oh, Doomsday is the king of hell. Yeah, that's crazy. Let's see what happens here. And this is exactly what I would want out of this book. This is Supergirl and Martian Manhunter head to hell because they realize Doomsday is going to come back to life even stronger than ever. And when they get down there to hell, they discover that Doomsday has been using hell to die over and over again and become stronger and stronger and stronger. Crazy stuff. It reintroduces, I don't know how you felt about this, Pete, but like a Mephisto figure, but in the DC universe and promises that we're going to get more of it. This is exactly what I wanted out of this book. Wow. Yeah, this was a ton of fun. The covers were just so badass and amazing. Uh, you know, I really thought it was such a cool move, though, the way March and Manhunter spoilers, uh, you know, ask hell for help. I did not see that coming. I thought that was such a cre creative, can't, cool. Can't spell help without hell. I don't um, think going to make that <laughs> Yeah, and and also then the second part uh, where you got the Hell Superman, uh, he reminded me of Spawn a Wondering. little bit, so I really like that. Oh yeah, I forgot about that. That was a really it's good a backup game. story as well. Yeah, I like that. Uh, it is nice. We have a Doomsday in Hell and then a Superman for Hell. What a couple of buddies! Um, this reminded me of the um, another comic we're going to talk about the Incredible current Incredible Hulk run, uh, where it was like, let's put this character that doesn't usually hang out in uh, a hell or Elbridge terror type place and see how they do. The only thing I thought was sort of fucked up is Martian Manhunter shows up and is like, hey, I pushed a dream into your brain. We have to go do a job. Like, <laughs> that's, that's not cool. Dude, he go needed help, dream. man. Mm -hmm. Okay, next time I need to help moving, I'm going to push a dream into your brain, Pete, <laughs> until you show up in Brooklyn to help me do some stuff. I'll help you move, bro. Oh, okay, great. That's really I'm nice moving beer. in with you and your brother in your ba your, the base. Oh, sweet. <laughs> Is there enough beer for two? <laughs> I drink a lot. <laughs> Let's move on and talk about Captara, Volume 2, Universal Truths, number one from Image Comics, written by Chip Zdarsky, art by Kagan McLeod. This is probably best described as masters of the universe, but they're all, or pretty much all, are gay. Uh, so <laughs> that's kind of the idea here. If you didn't read the first volume of it, there's also a bunch of folks from Earth who end up in this extremely LGBTQ plus friendly, to say it a, a little bit of a different way. Um, there you go. Masters of the universe. It's great. It's like Chip Zdarsky leading into his comedy stuff, having a good time. It's just a really nice counterbalance to all the stuff he's been doing on Batman and Daredevil, which, mind you, also good. But it's nice to have Chip get back to, like, weirdly fun. sexual, yeah. fun comics, I think. Uh, what I liked about this is, because uh, I agree with you, that's a great summation of it. It's not that much more, like, of different than actual he-man like <laughs> reading this i was reminded how all of he-man is also insane and this where they're like uh they're sort of rescuing these uh, pug looking cats that are being captured by robot wolves and i was like this is almost a he-man story so like <laughs> shouts to them yeah it's very nostalgic which is great but then it's kind of got a weird tripped art art to it which is fun uh, yeah, I loved all the references to, you know, GoBots and Transformers, and I really enjoyed the uh, Crystal Ball with Arms. So, 
Uh, I think this is a, a really fun and creative book. The robot wolves are the funniest visual to me because, yeah. like, they're wearing mech suits, but it isn't their arms and legs are in mech suits or their legs and legs are in mech suits. They're just sort of like slumped to hang there off of these mechs. It's the, hilarious. The mech suits are so boxy. They look like a toy you'd get at your local pharmacy. Mm -hmm. where it's yeah, like, it looks it's like not a transformer. It's like a transformer and you're like where do they get this <laughs> it looks like gobots pete's right it looks like gobots the boxier transformers let's talk about ultimate invasion number three for marvel written by jonathan hickman art by brian hitch we are three of four issues in here i think the last time we talked about it was just me and justin on the podcast so give an overview here we got the maker has headed back to the ultimate universe or at least a new universe totally remaking it in his image, changing everything. What we find out this issue is that he basically controls everything in the universe. He has one faction of the ultimate universe in classic Jonathan Hickman style. He lays this out with a map and a text page and oh, a little yeah. bit of like an indicator. Loves that stuff. He uh, uh, has been making it so that one person is a scapegoat for a generation to create wars and focus everybody there because what he's realized is people don't want universal peace they just want a lot of peace but not total peace like they want to think they're peaceful but they want an enemy at the same time so that's the maker's idea leading up to the big cliffhanger at the end of the issue the big reveal spoiler here turn away if you don't want to know uh, because it's an obvious one that we probably should have figured out but there is another reed richards in this universe and this reed richards gotcha. is wearing the mask of dr doom so i will say the big question that we were asking the last issue justin is where is this heading where's the invasion we get a hint of that there at the end because the other big yeah. reveal after the dr doom uh, mr fantastic is that Kang seems to be the big bad guy of the series, a remade, very different Ultimate Universe Kang. Um, what do you think about this, Justin, three issues in? Uh, I mean, it's it has some classic Hickman uh, complication. It's a lot of like sort of dense conversation happening here. I'm curious where he's setting up because I do think, is this gesturing towards some of the Mar Marvel Cinematic Universe stuff that we may be getting toward down the line? Uh, is that what this iteration of the ultimate universe is going to be a place for? Maybe. I, I don't know. It, it's interesting that we focus on Howard Stark here so much and not our guy, Anthony, as he's known in here. Um, Reed Richards, it's doom. All right, let's, let's go. He's, this he's is a lot of just, tears. this is his nine 11. This is a lot of just dudes standing around talking. This is just so much just talking a lot and i was just like okay here we go like you know uh invasion ultimates yeah let's get crazy and it was just like blah 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 blah, blah. this person's this person and uh, and i was like where's where's the where's the fun where's the action it's great art well, I feel like we're getting that maybe next issue. The people who are hanging out with Kang all look like they're the ultimate, the old ultimates and the old. Well, they, that's the army that attacked the last issue and was trying to take down the maker from the future. So we find out the character behind that is Kang. Um, just to give a little bit of the span here, if you guys don't know, if the listeners don't know. So there's four issues of this. Then there's going to be... I, I don't remember exactly what the issue is called, but it's like Ultimate Universe number one, which sets up the new Ultimate Universe. And then there's going to be a new line of Ultimate Comics. We don't know what's going to be in that yet. It seems like there's going to be a new Ultimate Spider-Man. seems like there's going to be a new Ultimate Avengers, maybe Ultimate Black Panther as well. We're not 100% sure. Jonathan Hickman is going to be involved in some way. To your point, Pete, I kind of agree with you here just on the basis of this being a third issue because... I don't mind the conversation. This feels like a lot of the Illuminati stuff that Hickman likes to hit a lot of times out of the gate, particularly in his image work um, more than his Marvel work, but uh, even though he had the Illuminati in Marvel. But at the same time, it's like if this was three of eight, I would feel very different about this than this being three of four, where I'm kind of like, 
let's get to it. What what is the ultimate invasion part of ultimate invasion? Let's go. Let's let's well, make it happen. It feels like it's going to move pretty seamlessly into the next thing. I know. But it, this feels like to me this was a four issue series that's setting up other series rather than telling a story in and of itself, which is always a bit of a bummer for me. This is like almost a zero issue of a series. Uh, Pete's worst yeah. nightmare. So uh, imagine that. It feels like laying out a lot of philosophy here, very 1984 uh, way of thinking about things. So maybe that's going to inform. I mean, uh, Hickman always goes over my head, so I shouldn't be surprised. There you go. Uh, here's something that probably went under your head. Gnort's illustrated swimsuit issue number <laughs> one for DC Comics. This, I was I was lost in this. This is way over my head. Yeah. <laughs> Written by Julie Benson and Shauna Benson, Steve Orlando, and John Lehman. Art by Megan Hetrick and Paul Pelletier. This is, uh, per the title, this is a classic swimsuit special we're getting one new story at the beginning of a bunch of the female characters of the dc universe teaming up to take down a nude penguin um this is not a joke that's didn't need thing that and but then we get a, a, a couple a of other p penguin not like a lord not just like a regular penguin. <laughs> yeah they're usually dude we also get a couple of stories that appeared in previous summer specials and things like that as well as a lot of covers that have also previously appeared that had everybody in swimsuits. What do you guys think about this? I just don't understand if a sport, why would a sports magazine do a whole issue of just people in swimsuits? Right? That's not a sport. How yeah, I mean, this is silly and fun, um, but, uh, you know, the, the Midnighter story I thought was very enjoyable. Seeing Penguin naked like that, I didn't think was that much fun. But, uh, you know, it seemed like people making this were having a blast. So, you know, why not? If you're into it, uh, you'll love it. If, you, if, you, if you're not laughing by the title, then I wouldn't recommend picking it up. I was laughing I feel like we. title. Oh, it's a good title. I think we've been all been wanting to see a Penguin naked for a while just to fill in the gaps in continuity that mm -hmm. we've been missing. Nope. And that did, was my really big did. problem. We read <laughs> the Penguin number one last week. The entire issue, I was like, he's wearing too many clothes. I, I don't get this. Why isn't he not nude? Those clothes are the ultimate spoiler mm. for his mm. new body. Mm. <laughs> are you saying, mm, like, yum? Like yum, yum, yum. I wish this was a little more original stories. I I really like the Midnight or Apollo story. I thought that was a very good story in particular. Um, but I think I read that before. So uh, that was a bit of fun. <laughs> the other one was fun and the covers were fun to see again. But um, I was really looking forward to this. I wish I wish this was all original and it wasn't. So that bummed me out a little bit. Let's talk about Local Man Gold from Image Comics, written by Tony Fleeks and Tim Seeley, art by Tony Fleeks and Tim Seeley. This focuses on a 90s, 2000s style superhero. Think Youngblood or Gen 13, and you've kind of got the idea. He gets exiled from his team to his hometown, and has to move back in with his parents. And in this issue, he ends up teaming up with the time-traveling 90s version of himself. And... So, not to compare it to something else, another series that I liked, Dotty Kate's crossover, crossover which yeah. brought together a bunch of books. This is <laughs> just because of one inclusion, way crazier than anything yeah. that happened in crossover. Hands yeah. down. But what did you guys? I think? agree. I I liked. It. I I think this book is doing such a good job of treading the line between just a great story about this character, you know, being a part of like this a superhero team. Uh, sort of shamelessly and then coming back and realizing that it, he needs to change or he has changed. And this issue really highlighted that. But including all these actual 90s comics characters from different titles, Striker, uh, the character from Dynamo 5, Fire Breather, a book that I loved. Back oh, yeah, there. Fire Breather. But I think I maybe the surprising run is Boof. Is no, Boof was not the surprising one. The surprising one to me, this is a big spoiler here. So the whole idea of the book is that like, there's some big image comics crossover going on where all of the characters are coming together, all the superheroes, and they're fighting a big evil, and they get displaced in time. So it's a classic, like, everybody goes off on their own teams, on their own dish, different missions to fix the timeline. So we're following some of these characters, the ones that you mentioned, Justin, who team up with our local man character, and the time displacement 
comes from the character Joan from Love oh. Everlasting, yeah. which is just the tone of like super serious Tom King, Elsa Charetier book, and then jamming it into the goofiest, most insane thing possible. And there was just a, I, I loved it. I love that they went for it, but there was such a total disconnect in my mind. And the ultimate resolution there, I I could not believe that they did. It was great. I'm, I'm glad Shots they went Battle for Pope, it. Yeah. Battle Pope was there. What did you think, Pete? Yeah, I mean, it's Tim Seeley. You know, he's having a lot of fun. It's fun kind of poking fun at the 90s and unfortunately how people would talk to women and stuff. But, uh, you know, it's uh, like the the present day guy or the future version guy gave me somebody to root for. So that was nice. Hmm. Interesting. Um, Incredible Hulk number three for Marvel, written by Philip Kennedy Johnson, art by Nick Klein. This is following the Incredible Hulk fighting a bunch of zombies and a big Cthulhu type character way underneath the ground to protect a little girl. Pete, you seem pretty psyched about this one. Take it away. Yes, this was just one of my favorites of the week. This was first off amazing covers. Hell yes, Philip Kennedy Johnson. Way to be the Philip Kennedy Johnson we needed right now. This is like Hellboy meets Hulk in all the right ways. Mm, I just love yeah. this kind of like version of Hulk where he's reluctant to kind of do stuff, but he's like, fine, I'll save you. And then becomes best friends with this kid. I I just love what's happening. I feel like the, the art style was so cool to kind of have him in this uh, red hell and uh, kind of be over it. And then the fact that like, they did this fun kind of battle uh, cry of like, should have stayed in your stupid hole was like such a fun connecting point for these two characters. I had such a blast with the tone of this. As soon as I opened this up, I was like, hell's motherfucking. Yeah, this is great. I really like the sort of broad scale horror that Philip Kennedy Johnson is doing here. Definitely different than the Al Ewing stuff that came before. Uh, but I, I like the variety while still staying the genre. Uh, and the art by Nick Klein is reminiscent of, reminiscent of Mike Diodato. If you're a fan of that mm, uh, sort of mm -hmm. classic Hulk stuff, I think you'll be happy here as well with a darker, more horror infused. It's just so good. The art is so good. Batman, Catwoman, the Gotham War Battle Lines. Ooh. Number one from DC Comics, written by Chip Zdarsky and T.D. Howard, art by Mike Hawthorne. In this issue, we're finding out what kicks off the Gotham War storyline as Catwoman... While Batman has been asleep for eight weeks after the Night Terrors event, yeah. she manages to corral the underworld of Gotham, get all of the henchmen, train them up to be a little more stealthy so they don't have to work for the Jokers and the Riddlers and the Penguins of the world. They can be their own men and women. And she presents that to Batman and the team and says, hey, crime is down 75%. Violent crime, at least, is down 75%. What do you think about that? And Batman, of course, is zero tolerance to it. Pete, I'm curious to go to you because you're a big Batman Catwoman shipper, but they're on opposite sides here. Are you okay? Yeah, well, thank you for that. Yes, I I, uh, I think this was a fun choice to kind of have the... Uh, you know, with Batman kind of down and out for a little bit, what's Catman, uh, Catwoman going to do? You know, okay. she's bored. She doesn't know, uh, you know, what to do. So she makes this choice, and it's a huge choice. And then she tries to pitch it to Batman. But you can't just walk up on Batman and be like, listen, this is what's going to happen, all right? We're just going to rob, like, crazy rich people. Not normal people, just crazy rich. Oh, that's right. Oops, you're rich. Uh, no, you. so Batman's like, dude, you can't just be like, listen, we're going to rob rich people, so it's cool, right? It's cool. You can just look the other way. That's not how Batman works. So, yeah, of course, there's going to be uh, lines drawn. I think it's a very interesting conflict. And, uh, I, you know, Batman... Batman and Catwoman kind of like have this love-hate relationship and he kind of looks the other way sometimes with her and I think she kind of pushed that a little bit and so yeah I'll be interested to see what this means going forward who's going to take what side uh but man a cool idea great execution unbelievable art I can't wait to see what's gonna happen this is this is really cool uh, for a man who is like so zero tolerance here when he like you know was going to marry Catwoman 
I thought it was sort of a strange to have him take such a hard line here. Dude, it's sort of, it's he's sort of all hard to, lines. What are you talking about? Yeah, he did almost marry her, which he has a big, very public discussion about in front of a bunch of uh, strangers. Yeah, right in front so of I everybody. That was weird. Also, yeah. I thought he was like, my parents were rich. And it's sort of like, that's a weird thing to shout in any room. I thought almost the bigger thing in terms of what Chip Zdarsky has been doing with Batman is there's a bunch of stuff about the Batman of Zer and R in here yes. and being like, okay, Bruce, you go do what you need to do, but you're really hurting right now. And there's a flash of like a bunch of other characters, maybe behind Zer and R. Whatever Chip Zdarsky is building here with Batman is kind of terrifying. It's like, quite a machine. Well, also the missing hand thing, which I was uh, yeah. Right. All of this stuff, like Chip Zdarsky is changing Batman in very big ways. I'm very excited and terrified to see what will happen. But this is a great kickoff to this event. I'm excited to read it. Why don't we move on with Mighty Morphin Power Ranger 30th Anniversary Special Number 1 from Boob Studios, written by Ryan Parrott, Jamie Joe Johnson, Melissa Flores, Matt Groom, Maria Ingrande Mora, Margred, Margred? Scott, art by Eleonora Carliti, Hendry Procenta, Marco Reda, Francesco Motoroni, uh, Joe Mingyang, and Daniel Palace. I read all of these. I spent a whole done. week. Whole week. I'm so oh, sorry. True. I'm so sorry to everybody. Uh, this is what the title says. There's a bunch of Power Rangers stories taken away. <laughs> yeah, there's... Uh, Oh, go ahead. I, I just want to say real quick, like I actually really enjoyed this. It, mm -hmm. The characters and a lot of the first, the first handful of stories I thought were really great. Then you just get like a whole, the whole back end is like them morphing. <laughs> I was like, well, I don't know. I needed to see like eight pages of different ways that they morph it up. But uh, it's also crazy to me. There's so much going on, and then when they talk about their Zords, I was like, they don't need half of this stuff. Just have them be in the suits with the knives or whatever. Like they don't have to get in their big machines. That's what I thought. And I'll tell you what, if you guys have any opinion, I don't care because I'm out of here. I'm sick of this. I'm wow. Of Power Rangers. No, Justin, don't go. No, Justin, I'm don't done. go. Get out of here out. with your bullshit. Wow. Different wow. opinions. Oh, man, he's gone. Finally, now we can really talk. Good about riddance. This. Yeah, I, I agree with Justin. This is a fun collection of stories. Um, you know, they, they do everything here from saving their favorite juice bar to you know big wedding up uh, and then proposing and then you know uh giant you know then there's robots hugging robots you know there's a lot of different things going on in here uh but yeah it's fun uh i think it's a great celebration of the uh power rangers so uh go go power ranger i really like the juice bar story in particular they gave it a really nice human element but yeah i agree it's surprisingly good anniversary issue let's move on to one that i know you were very hyped for blade number two from marvel written by brian hill art by elena casa grande this is following blade as he's trying to track down a bunch of new evil folks and he is hooking up with a flame from his past i would say if you want to watch the high octane michael bay version of a blade movie but in comic book form pick this up i Cannot believe, even even reading the first issue, which I was like, okay, I like this. This is like a Blade movie in comic book form. Nope, this takes it even up another absolutely batshit insane level. Hells yeah. Uh, now we're talking, this is such a great issue. Uh, love all the action. Love all the fighting. Blade jumping off of a building into a helicopter. Uh, just, oh my God. Uh, so, so much over the top badass shit. Love the art style. I thought this was a great uh, kind of heightening of Blade a little bit in such a fun way. And absolutely fantastic art to back it up. Uh, this is very exciting to read. I, I think this is just such a cool page turner. The layout of the helicopter fight in particular by Elena Casagrande I thought was really, really awesome. As you can see, his way working his way through it. Also, Brian Hill is clearly writing him as Wesley Snipes. So again, if you like the movies, check this out. This is bonkers action. 
Catwoman Uncovered, number one from DC Comics, written by Ariana Turturro, art by PJ Holden. This is another cover collection here, of course, focusing on Catwoman. We get a light theme throughout. I don't think this was as, as strong as the Poison Ivy one, which I really liked a lot, but there's still a lot of good Catwoman covers. So I appreciate that they are paying tribute to these artists by putting these out. Yeah, I mean, the, the covers are beautiful. It's really fun uh, stuff. Great collection of covers. But, I mean, the story, uh, Catwoman's robbing the reader. So mean, you know? Mm -hmm. You're taking your time out of your day, and then she's taking advantage of you. It's, uh, you know, that's what it's like to live in Gotham. And, uh, you know, I think it's, uh, it's, you know, it's not a very welcoming environment. Did you, I put a bunch of my jewelry in the comic book, and she took it. Did the same thing happen to you? Same. Oh, God, Catwoman. Yeah. Come yeah. on. Okay. Let's move on to a very advanced review here. Beneath the trees where nobody sees. No. One. This is. No. <laughs> I, no. <laughs> this is. I out, cannot believe this. I out cannot believe October 18th from IDW by Patrick Horvath. So this is what. Horvath is describing as cozy horror, and he means that legitimately. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna spoil the concept here because they've already talked about it publicly, so I think it's fair to talk about. But it is about a adorable bear character. She owns a local hardware store in this sweet, quaint little town, and every once in a while, she goes to the big city so that she can work out her serial killer homicidal impulses and absolutely slice up people and you see it in graphic fashion ultimately what happens is she does it outside because she doesn't want to like destroy her idyllic town some other things happen by the end of the issue i this I, is a how to murder people this is horrible <laughs> you shouldn't be putting stuff like this out there this is just this an, is not a, a how to nightmare murder of an not idea. A murder ducks ducks duck men Stop spoiling it for people. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, it's already in the preview pages, so it's okay. I can talk about it. The I thought this was phenomenal. If you like horror, I understand if you don't like horror or scare very easily, and I don't say that derisively at all, like Pete, don't check this out because this is... Do crazy. not. This but is awful. This is like Precious Moments meets Saw is the way that I describe it, kind of. This is like, hey, little kid, you want to read comic books and learn how to fucking murder people? It is not read teaching this. you how to murder people. Yes, it is. It is a step-by-step -step <laughs> process of killing a stranger and getting away with it. It is awful. Well, uh, she doesn't quite get away with it, as we sort of find out about by the end of the issue. I thought the art style was incredible here. It perfectly channels this these adorable animal characters throughout the town. It feels like a very lived-in town immediately, which is really impressive. And if you are looking for something that's going to make your spine tingle while making you say awe at the same time, Beneath the Trees Where Nobody Sees is something to check out this fall. It's a perfect October Halloween book. It's a fucking... I couldn't believe what I was reading. It's this adorable looking character doing some of the most gruesome things so calmly and so f meticulously. It will chill you to the core. Uh, don't, don't, this is just, I, uh, it's, it's insane. It's absolutely And never insane. in human history has a bear done something terrible before. That's right. Not since... Not since Riverdale. Have you seen a bear? <laughs> no. Or Archie lived. Bear. Archie <laughs> lived. So you can't even, not even in Riverdale did they have something so mm -hmm. grotesque and gruesome. This is great. Definitely pick it up. World Tree. Let's let's turn to something that's a little calmer and less murder happy. World Tree number five from Image Comics, written by James nope. the Fourth, art by Fernando Blanco. It's all coming out here. This is the big turn for this issue. We've been following the burgeoning arrival of this undernet that is trying to destroy the entire world and turn everybody into matter murder happy people. The big turn of the last issue is we find out that the naked lady who is attacking everybody is in fact one of the main characters sister but here naked blood lady it's naked, naked blood lady oh sorry about that here we flash forward to the future where we find out how things turn out spoiler 
not very well. The Nightmare ambition show. and scope of the series is only getting bigger issue by issue, and I continue to be very impressed by it. Uh, JT4 is an unbelievable writer, and this is some of the most fucked up shit. You know, if you can get past a, a naked blood lady um, in some kind of, like, futuristic uh, killing spree, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know, man. Maybe I'm too old and comics are too dark now or something. I, I don't know, man, but this, I was just like, God damn, this is, and it's just, uh, but the art's unbelievable. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I agree with you. Fernando Blanco's art and characterizations in particular are really, really incredible. This is also, I say this every issue, a book for adults. There's a lot of nudity and violence in here, so tune away. Tell you what, let's get away from two books with horror elements and violence. Stop saying that, because you know you're not. And instead, talk about Wolverine number 36 from Marvel, written by Benjamin Percy, art by Jeff Shaw. This is continuing the Weapons of Vengeance storyline. Pete, these are two of your favorite characters we're talking about now. Wolverine teaming up with Ghost Rider. That's got to be cool for you. What a fun time, right? You having a good time? You having, no, having fun? No, I'm not having a fun time. <laughs> because a Wolverine casually walks into a Weapon X program thing here, and then all of a sudden is horribly sabotaged and turned into Halverine. So oh, that was your problem with it? Not the fact that Ghost Rider and Wolverine have teamed up to kill a child? Well, would you I, I was getting there, Jesus Christ. Oh, I'm sorry. And then this creepy kid, this creepy kid who is just like so evil and so creepy. Uh yeah, this is a nightmare book. Um I, I, yeah, I guess combining Ghost Rider and Wolverine is kind of cool. Wolverine, he's called Wolverine. He's a flaming Ghost Rider. What a ghost, uh, a flaming Wolverine. What could you be mad about? You know. Sure. Oh boy. All right, fine. Let's make things a little sunnier by talking about the Riddler Year One Number Six from DC Comics, written by Paul Dano, art by Stephen. You had Sonic. such a time curating this stack this week, <laughs> didn't you? No, this is a total accident. To be perfectly honest with you, the uh, this is the Not final issue it. of the Riddler book that is leading up to the Batman. It's giving us the origin story of the Riddler, the way that you see him on screen. I have been loving this series up until maybe like the la like the second half of the series, to be honest with you. Stephen Subic's art is phenomenal. Like the layouts, the way that he is plumbing through the Riddler's madness visually is gorgeous. Really impressed. We talked about Amon Villani a little earlier on. Really impressed how much Paul Dano put into this book. Like it's not it's not easy to do a vertigo style book when you're an actor who played the Riddler and has just done other stuff, but I think he did it really well here. But this is the book that I was kind of dreading with this, where it's just and now we're filling in the dots until we get to the beginning of the Batman, the end. And there's still some great moments in here that are really dark and really upsetting, the way the series has always been. But it ended, this sounds very stupid to say, but in a very predictable way, given that we know where it ended. And I wish, I wish it had showed us something different versus now go watch the Batman, now on Max, you know? Well, first off, how dare you? Paul Dano is so much more than just an actor, okay? Oh, and he proves that in his writing. I'll say the same thing I've been saying for every issue of this. I'm happy for Paul Dano. Um, <laughs> it's got to be great for him to be able to write a comic book or write uh, something about a character he played and has such knowledge of. Uh, but I don't like my Riddler this fucking creepy. Um, and... But the art, like you said, is truly impressive and uh, really uh, uh, something to be held up uh, for what the panels are and the whole tone of this and uh, some real badass Batman panels in this thing, too. For a movie tie-in, this didn't have to look as good or be as good as it was, but it was, and it stands up and stands out as a comic book on its own. All right, for real, let's move on from the dark block here and move on and talk about Alex, Alice Never After, number two from Boom Studios, written by Dan Pedosian, art by Dan Pedosian and Giorgio Spoletta with Cyril Glarum. This is a book that, this is kind of fun, focuses on... 
uh, Alice from uh, Through the Looking Glass and uh, Alice in Wonderland, uh, she has been lobotomized and is crazy and is retreating to Wonderland in order to escape all that while everybody in her family and her life exploit her. Um, so fun stuff. What do you think, Pete? Yeah, real fun. Uh, now, this is uh, super twisted and messed up. Uh, super the twist art, ass. though, is absolutely amazeballs. Uh, love the style. It really brings you into this kind of wonderful, twisted world. Very interesting story. Uh, you know, she's trying to be a good queen, but it's very hard, especially when you're surrounded by absolute uh, morons. So it's it's tough. Uh, but, um, I, I like that she's fighting to try to be good, even though I'm really worried about her health. I will say the same thing I said for the first issue. I really like this series, but I wish there was a more connection between the Wonderland world and the real world, which we got in the first series and are not quite getting here yet. I wonder if that has something to do with her lobotomy in terms of separating the two parts of her mind. And maybe that's what mm -hmm. they're going for. Maybe that's what we'll get to eventually. Um, but like you said, the art is great throughout the London sequences, the Wonder World, Wonderland sequences. They're both really, really good. So even if I'm not quite sure what this is going for yet, I'm still willing to follow it. Superboy, The Man of Tomorrow, number five from DC Comics, written by Kenny Porter, art by Janoi Lindsay. This is the second to last issue of the series that has taken Superboy to space to fight a bunch of folks that are created from clone material like him and are also super powered. Um, what do you think about this? This continues to be great. I mean, you know, this is uh, Superboy talking about, you know, struggling uh, going back and forth on what's the right thing to do. And I always think that's a great thing. And uh, yeah, just really uh, kind of some fun, intense fight scenes, ripping people's arms off and stuff. But great art, cool story. Can I ask you a quick question? Sure. That's all right, Pete. Would it be Super Boy Bananas or Super Boyt Bananas? Uh, Boyt. Okay, thank you. The Hunger and the Dusk, number two from IDW, written by G. Willow Wilson, art by Chris Wild Goose. This is following parallel storylines in a world where there's orcs and humans, and there's some sort of external threat. We think it's probably vampires, is our guess. We talked about with the first issue, but we're not 100% sure. But this has forced the orc and human factions to band together and go on a quest. We get the beginnings of that quest, and meanwhile, we get to see two of the orcs who are from separate orc clans who got married, who are now trying to figure out their lives together, or they get married this issue and are trying to figure out their lives together. This is a really interesting world. I like Chris Wild Goose's art. It, draw, it straddles the line between you know, more typical fantasy and a little cartoony in a nice yeah. way. It, it's not quite as exaggerated as like a Chris Bocciolo, but it's along those lines. What do you think about this, Pete? Yeah, I, I really love the art and the character design. And I feel like uh, the first part is a very touching story. And then, you know, uh, the giant white wolves and sad second story uh, about death, uh, and stuff is is very interesting so i think they're uh doing a great job with this book and they have an amazing team and it's kind of uh you know i'm a sucker for kind of like commenting on human human relationships through these kind of orca warriors and stuff like that so i think it's very interesting and cool yeah i like this this is a good one to get on board with since it feels like it's only gonna get bigger in terms of the story speaking of bigger in terms of the story the sandman universe nightmare country the glass house number four from dc comics written by james town the fourth art by lisandro esterin this is picking up not just on the last issue of this but also the sandman universe thessaly special which is very important to understand what's going on here they're this is almost too complicated to explain other than I will say from a spoiler perspective, a large part of this series and the previous series has been question marks. What is going on? The characters try to figure out why these things are happening to them and what the bigger plan and story is here. And what we find out at the end here, this is a really big spoiler. So turn away if you don't want to know what we find out here at the end is this might be a legitimate sequel to Sandman with the other endless once again 
targeting Sandman, Daniel Sandman now, the one who ends up at the end of the Sandman series, um, through all of these other characters. So we're sort of getting this ground level view on another plot to destroy Morpheus, potentially, is where they're going to go. And just the indication of that and blowing that out that big is wild. Yeah, agreed. Uh, this is just really awesome. I want to back up the truck a little bit and talk about the covers. There's one cover where the evil teeth guy is eating sushi in his Ugh. eye mouth. And oh, oh no. my God, is no, that thank you. gross and fucking amazing <laughs> all at once. Super type bananas art. Love the look and the way it leads the paneling and the perspectives and the different panels. Really something. The uh, and also like the whole cat thing looks really cool too. Uh, the way that was drawn, uh, just uh, really impressive, really impressive stuff. Cool. Why don't we finish up here by talking about two advanced graphic novels? Not something we normally do on the stack, but it's, cool. they're both worth talking about. Cosmic Detective. This is coming out September 20th from Image Comics. It's written by Jeff Lemire and Matt Kent, art by Dave Rubin. This is almost exactly what you would think from the title and the team that's working here. Like we talked about earlier, we love Jeff Lemire. And we love all the stuff that he does. It is Wild Matt Ideas. Kent, we also love, love Matt Kent. Same sort of thing. Wild Ideas. Also really good at structure. I think that's something that Matt dr drills into very heavily. And you get the best of both worlds here with both of these writers. Plus Dave Rubin's art, which is... Uh, not Jack Kirby-esque, but it's certainly like channeling that a little bit with a little bit of the blockiness of Michael Avon Omig, I would say, is kind of what we're getting here. Mm -hmm. And it is about, it's it's a straightforward detective story. And I say that complimentarily, like it's very noir in terms of this detective finds a body, it spirals out in this very Chinatown way into bigger and bigger things happening. But because it's Lemire and Kid. There's these wild, big ideas about the cosmology of the universe that gets into a lot of Kirby-esque thoughts about gods and aliens and other things. Overall, I, I thought this was great. I was really impressed by this. This is one that I saw it was a graphic novel, and I was like, ah, well, let's not read it. And then Justin was like, no, no, I read it. It's really good. And I was like, oh, okay, let's put it back in. And I'm glad that he pushed for it, even if he got angry halfway through the podcast and left, because yeah. this is a really impressive book. What do you think, Pete? Yeah, not to spoil anything, but this is some real uh, tripped out future detective shit, and I love it. I love the art style. I love all the uh, fun characters and all the interesting stuff going on. I thought this is a hell of a, a all-star team, and they are really bringing it in this, and you can tell. Yeah, it's also very accessible for a Lemire and Kent book. Like, I think they could yeah, air that true. way, but... Point. That was something I was worried about seeing both of the names. I was like, yeah, oh, this is going to be here we go. yeah. <laughs> impenetrable. Yeah. But it's not. It's They use those noir trappings in the arc of a noir story to make it accessible with these big cosmic, like I keep saying, Kirby-esque ideas. So if you like comics, if you like noir stories, you are going to love Cosmic Detective. Pick it up when it comes out from Image Comics on September 20th. Last but not least, let's talk about Witches of Brooklyn, Spell of a Time, out yeah. September 5th from Random House. This is by Sophie, Sophie uh, Escabase. I I'm forgetting whether we had her on for the first or second book to talk about Witches of Brooklyn. I think it was the second book. And this is the third book of the series. Exactly what the title says. It follows a young witch who lives in Brooklyn and is trying to figure out her powers and her place. It's a very YA-focused book. Um as a New York resident and fan of witchy fiction, I thought this was delightful. A lot of books don't really hit the place in the right way, you know, and this felt like, oh, yes, this is somebody who actually knows Brooklyn and knows the places in Brooklyn. They didn't just see it on a map or a picture. It feels like something that is set in Brooklyn. Um, but whether you live here or not, I think it's very accessible and very fun and very relatable. And there's a great mystery at the heart here, too, in terms of a missing mermaid that I really enjoyed reading. This is a very charming book that I, I, I like reading and um, will work for any fans of witches or non. Pete? Yeah, not to, I try not to spoil here, but mm -hmm. this is really fun. Love the art style, really cool characters. Uh, love the turtle, 
love the mermaid. Oh, that, yeah, the turtle uh, is so good. Yeah, uh, and yeah, I just I think this is just really great storytelling with some heart in there and a little love of Brooklyn, a little love of witchcraft, and it's just such a great mix that kind of jumps out at you when you start reading this. It's a great world to kind of get lost in and have have some fun. Yeah, I agree. I, I think one of the things that I really liked about it is it takes its time telling the story. Mm -hmm. it that does. it's not it's very confident. Yeah. Yeah, it's not a breakneck pace. It lets you sit with the characters and it lets you explore the characters and their emotions, let them work with each other. The uh the the people that she lives with is that her grandparents i'm forgetting now i'm totally blanking but yeah. whatever it is like the older folks are mm -hmm. really charming and delightful it's just every character is just so enjoyably and satisfyingly drawn it's it's a cast that you want to hang out with and it's the sort of thing that also i'll mention i think you could just jump in with this one if you really want to but once you read volume three you're going to want to go back and read volume one and volume two as well. also has a cool like miyazaki feel to it with oh the different yeah good call i like characters it. and stuff very good pick up that one as well coming out september 5th from random house it's great and that is it for the stack if you'd like to support this podcast and all the podcasts we do patreon.com slash comic book club also we do a live show every tuesday night at 7 p.m to facebook and youtube come hang out we'd love to chat with you about comic books apple spotify stitcher or ooh, not stitcher that doesn't exist anymore apple spotify or the app of your choice to subscribe listen and follow the show at comic book live on twitter slash x comic book club live on tiktok and instagram comicbookclublive.com for this podcast and many more. Until next time, we'll see you at the comic book shop. Yeah! Man.